for all of y'all reading Eye of the World for the readathon, get used to Nynaeve doing this a lot. Hey guys, Erica here, and welcome to my channel, Geeklet Read Stuff. And today I thought we would go over my November wrap up. I wanted to get this taken care of kind of before I got really caught up in the Shelf Space Readathon, which started today. So I really wanted to get this out of the way before I forgot all of these books because I read 12 more. So that's why I'm not like all dolled up. I just got off work a little while ago. It's dark outside, so I have my lights on. So sorry if the lighting's weird. But let's go ahead and hop into it. So the first book I read this month was The Dragon Republic by R.F. Huang. And this is the kind of the follow up story to the Poppy War. And in this book, it takes place at the end of the third Poppy War. Ren and her group, the Kike, are kind of on the run. They meet back up with Neza, who wants to introduce them to his father, who's the Dragon Warlord. And the Dragon Warlord says that he wants to bring democracy to the land and fight the Empress. Well, since Ren's, you know, wants some sweet vengeance. And to get back at the Empress, she signs up. And this book is just kind of about this journey and what happens to the land as the Dragon Warlord is building up his troops, building up his forces. And I love this book. This is my favorite book of the Poppy War trilogy. We see Ren in this book at her most vulnerable. There's points in this book where she is completely broken. You know, she's dealing with the guilt of the events that happened in the Poppy War, her just like relationship with Alton and how that's affected her. Because Ren is a girl who just cannot make emotional connections with people. And it really deeply affects her in this book. And then on top of it all, she's having to deal with her opium addiction. So we really see Ren kind of struggle and she's broken down in this book. And it's, she has to find that strength to kind of build herself back up. I really love the way that Ren is presented. You never fully sympathize with her, but you can see how someone like Ren has made the decisions that she's made. And I think it's really important to have characters out there that you can look at and you don't want to see yourself in that role. You know, you don't want to fully support them because Ren's not a great person, but sometimes Ren makes the decisions she makes based on the information she has available. So a lot of the times Ren's just kind of working on poor uh, information, but I love this book. The writing is improved over the Poppy War. Like you can see it in some of the passages are just written really beautifully. The pacing in this book is great. The world building in this book is stellar. You can really see the effects of war in this one. You can see the effects of war on the civilians, on the military, on the leadership. Just everything's being broken down and crushed under this almost never ending cycle of violence. You also have a lot of the Hesperians, I believe that's how they're pronounced in this book, and kind of the impact of foreign entities in a land. Gosh, I just, I love this series. The more time I spend away from it, the more I appreciate it. Now, the second book I read this month, I read it on my Kindle, and that's Jade City by Fonda Lee. Now, in Jade City, we are on the island of Kegon, where these special warriors exist called Green Bones, who kind of can infuse their body with jade and it can make them like better warriors, stronger, faster. Now these green bones have always kind of defended the land, but now they're kind of in a modern-ish day society and they're kind of broken down into clans and they have like clan wars. So we're following the Call family and the Ayats, another clan there on the island, and both of them are kind of like building up their power, absorbing smaller clans, leading up to this final clash between these two clans. Now what they're kind of fighting over is there's a new drug out that allows like foreigners and non-green bones to be able to use jade to enhance their abilities as well. 
Now in this book, we mostly follow four characters of the Call family. There's Kilo, who's like the clan, I guess like the main guy who gets stuff done. They call him the clan horn in the book. Uh, his older brother, Lan, who's kind of the head of the clan, who's recently taken it over from his grandfather. And he's still kind of a little bit on shaky ground leading this clan. And their sister, Shay. Now, Shay was trained as a green bone, but at some point she left the island, went and kind of experienced the world. She followed a boy and got her heart broke. So she comes back home and she's kind of trying to decide where she fits into her family and in the clan. And the fourth character is this younger fella named Andy, who's been adopted into the family. And he's like getting ready to graduate from his school and become like a soldier for his clan. And I just thought this was such an original setting. I'm not a big fan of like movies and stories about gangsters and stuff, but something about this just really, it really caught me. And I don't know if it was like the kind of the combination of almost like a Kung Fu movie with a gangster movie or what, but it was such an interesting setting that I couldn't get enough of it. There was great world building. I think the author did a really good job building this world without just having these huge info dumps because a bad info dump will stick out to me like a sore thumb. And I never really caught that in this book. Uh, the pacing felt really good to me. I got really kind of involved with this book and I just kept wanting to read more and more and more of it. I like the characters. The three siblings, I think, play off of each other very well. And the side characters were also kind of really interesting as well. I just can't wait to move on in this series, check out the second book. I might read it this month. Uh, I haven't quite decided yet. Now, the third book I read this month was Don Shard by Brandon Sanderson. That's his small novella tying into Rhythm of War. I say small. I mean, it's Brandon Sanderson small, so it was still like, what, two, three hundred pages. But uh, in this book, the ghost ship is found with no survivors on it. So Navani sends some Windrunners, including Lopin, onto the ship that's owned by Ryzen. And she has her own reasons for wanting to go to the island. And it's just kind of about their journey. We have a lot of character building with Lopin and Ryzen. It's done well. I mean, it's Brandon Sanderson, so you know what you're getting into. He did a good job. The story did feel a little rushed to me, but... I don't know. It could have just been me. And this book had a little too much Lopin. <laughs> He's a fun character, but I did like Lyft in the other novella more. And uh, the ending felt a little flat, but it could have just been I was really excited to get into Rhythm of War that Don Shard almost felt like a chore for me to get through. Okay. The fourth book I read this month was The Stepford Wives by Ira Levin. And I read this for my library's SFF group. This is not a story I typically gravitate towards, but uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the movies. If you have, the movie kind of follows this book pretty well, but I'll give like a little short summary. We have Joanna and her husband, Walter, and they've recently moved to the town of Stepford. Now, this is kind of a modern couple. Uh, Joanna's kind of big into feminism, women's lib, and her husband's a pretty modern guy who listens to his wife and respects her ideas. Well, when he moves into town, he discovers there's a men's association and he joins it. At first, it seems like he's kind of joining it as a laugh. And that leaves Joanna kind of searching for her own friends. So as she talks to the women in the town, she realizes like these women are really absorbed into their housework and they don't get out much. When they go shopping, they put their groceries in the cart in a very neat way. Like everything about these women re are really neat and tidy. Well, Joanna finally meets a friend named Bobby and Bobby's recently moved to town herself. And the two of them kind of set out to try to discover the mystery behind the behavior of the women of the town. And like I said, if you've seen the movie, you pretty much know the story. Um, this was a really tight book. It was maybe 150, 160 pages. It wasn't very big, but just once it started, it just flew through. Like every single kind of word mattered in this book. And it's an interesting book to think about. You know, what was the author's intent with this book? 
Was it a warning to women? Was it indulgement of male fantasy? My only kind of problem with the book is Joanna herself. Like Joanne is presented as this really modern woman, but she was never the most proactive character. Like when everything kind of pops off and she realizes there's a problem, she doesn't do a whole heck of a lot to stop that problem from happening. But like I said, this isn't something that I would typically read. I kind of appreciate that I got a chance to read it. It's a fine story. <laughs> but I will never read it again. Fifth book I read was The Fires of Vengeance by Evan Winter, the second book in the Burning series. Now this book starts out, the Yohame people are divided in a civil war. We have our main character Tao as the champion of Siora, who are out there with their armies, but her sister Essie has the capital city and her champion is Obasio Dili, who Tao blames for the death of his father. Now, if you read the first book of the series, you know that Tao's just obsessed with revenge against the death of his father, and he blames Odili for that. So Tao is kind of more than happy to sign up with Siora and help her achieve her goals as long as he is allowed revenge for his father. And basically the book is just about the conflict between the two sisters, you know, who's gonna come out on top, who's gonna lead the Omehi people, because they're still having to deal with those outside threats to their country. And I'm very, very happy to report in this book, Tal has grown. While he's still focused on revenge, he is no longer kind of that one note character that we saw in the first book. I'm gonna put this book down, it's very heavy. He's better able to build connections and relationships with people. And as such, he's just more interesting to read because we do spend most of the book kind of in his head through his perspective. A consequence is a huge theme in this book. Tao and Siora have to deal with the consequences of the decisions that they've made. You know, Tao has to deal with the injuries to his friend. Siora kind of has to deal with the fact that she knows that, you know, she sends people to their deaths. So these characters grow a whole lot. If you wasn't a big fan of the first book, there's nothing in here that's really going to convince you to read this. But if you did enjoy the first book, I do think this one is a great improvement over the first. We have stronger female characters. Siora has this vibrant personality. She's fun to read about and watch her you know, participate with Tao and just grow as a queen. She has this great advisor, Naya, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, Naya was a blast to read and follow. I really liked her kind of character arc throughout the story. As usual, um, the author does a great job with these fight scenes, these battle scenes. They're all just tight and they're easy to envision. Just really vibrant scenes. The world building's good. There are still like these training montage scenes. I think that's just something you're gonna have to deal with with uh, Evan Winter's writing. I don't mind them. I think they were done well. The pacing of this book can kind of go at a breakneck speed sometimes. It was hard for me to kind of understand how much time had progressed throughout this book. I, I still can't tell you. I don't know. Did a month pass? A week pass? A year? I'm not sure because there was no like kind of frames for me to kind of grasp onto. But overall, I super enjoyed this book. I'm very much looking forward to the third book coming out in the series. This one does end on a little bit of a cliffhanger though. So if that's something that irritates you like it irritates me, I don't know what to tell you. might just want to hold out to the third book. I'm not real sure because it definitely ends on a cliffhanger. Also, another thing about this book that drove me crazy. Most of the book is written from this one POV, right? But there's a couple of chapters that mix it up and they're from a different POV. Turns out that's a huge pet peeve. I don't mind one perspective and I don't mind many perspectives, but I think you have to pick. 
if you're going to spend most of the book in one perspective, but you throw in a couple of other chapters through someone else's perspective, even if those are good chapters, and they are in this book, I get really, really annoyed. Uh, the sixth book I read was The Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wong. And this story takes place in a small village in the Kaiganese Empire. And in that village, we're following members of the Masuda family who are have this really kind of pure blood that allows them to exercise these powers over ice and water and to create, I believe it's called the Whispering Blade, which is like a super special ability that only certain members of their family can produce. And mostly we're following two characters. We're following 14 year old Mamoru. He's like the eldest son of this family. And we're following his mother, Mitsaki. Okay, so Mamoru is this great kid that tries hard, up every day, challenges himself. You know, he wants to become a great warrior that his father's proud of. Now, one day he goes to school and kind of his worldview is just challenged by a new student who comes into town. Then we have Misaki and she's a woman who's not happy with her life. She's in a marriage where she doesn't feel loved and appreciated. She doesn't feel a strong connection with her children, or she feels like some guilt because she doesn't connect to all of her children. She had a lot of fun in her past doing superhero stuff, and she misses those days. And these are some really fun characters kind of to follow and to watch them grow. In some ways, this almost felt like two books. Um, and I considered DNFing this book for a long time. I was probably 50% into this book before just something kind of switched for me. And then I sort of fell in love with it. I really did enjoy this book, but it's going to sound like I didn't. As for the negatives of this book, it did feel like there was a lot of info dumping. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, like that sort of stuff really sticks out to me. And there would be just chunks of history and information about this world and the empire. And I couldn't have cared less. Like I kind of skimmed through it all. It left a little bit of an icky taste in my mouth. And a lot of these were kind of in that first half of the book. Uh, the setting was kind of strange to me in some ways. This was like a very traditional old school kind of village, but there was like signs of modern technology. They were putting up cell phone towers. There was a TV. We have Misaki's whole backstory where she was like a crime fighting vigilante, which was weird. But I do think that some of the problems like that that I had are because this story is connected to the author's previous like young adult. I think it's a young adult series. And in a lot of ways, I just wish she had just disconnected this and had it as own separate story because then it wouldn't have had some of that baggage carry through. But then once we get to the second half of the book where we're focusing more on Misaki and her relationship with her husband, I love that stuff. It was just so cool to see this mother kind of deal with these issues that she had, you know. She felt a lot of guilt and remorse and just watching her struggle through all that and kind of become the person that she was deep inside that she just kept trying to push and shove down and watch this relationship between her and her husband. You know, it just became a really beautiful story after that. There were just a lot of really jaw dropping moments in this book. It's so much is jammed into it that, man, I'm still processing this book, but I did enjoy it. I would just, I would really like to see more from this author. I wish that she would kind of continue writing this story, but I don't really know where you would go from here. Just, you know, Misaki is such a great character. She was just, blew my mind, probably my favorite character all month. Loved her. Finally, the seventh book I read was The Burning God. I am terrified to say anything about this book because I know so many people are still working on it and reading it. Uh, Overall, though, like, I liked it. It was great. Um, I don't know how the series really could have ended any other way. I'll miss my time with these characters. Like I said, I'm terrified to say too much about this because I know so many people are picking this up for the readathon. 
I just I hope you guys have a great time with this book. I did. It's hard to say goodbye to characters and I just recently finished this so it it's difficult for me to even know how I feel about this ending yet. I think only time will tell. I'll miss I'll miss hanging out with Ren. And the last book I read, which I'm technically still reading, I'm not quite finished with it, is Mad Adam by Margaret Atwood. I thought I could knock that out in two days, but I I can could not knock it out in two days. So sorry team Kevin McAllister, I'm gonna work on it some tonight and then I'll be done with it, I promise. Uh, so basically, this book kicks off like at the end of Oryx and Crake. Uh, we have Toby and Ren. They've rescued Amanda from the Pain Ballers, and they find Jimmy and end up taking him back to like the collection of Mad Adamers who are living in the Cobb Hut. And the Krakers end up kind of following them along because they're worried about Jimmy. Well, they're used to Jimmy telling them a story every night, and. Toby ends up having to do that for Jimmy since Jimmy's uh, incapacitated. Now the Krakers have a lot of interest in Zeb so she ends up telling them like the story of Zeb. And basically this is a book about the power of stories. You know Zeb gets gives the story to Toby, Toby processes it in a way and then she feeds it back to the Krakers in a way that they can kind of understand because Zeb's kind of this tough guy who doesn't mind if he swears and all of these things. And the Krakers just don't understand that. Y'all, Margaret Atwood is so talented that, you know, it makes me mad, really. It's not cool someone has all of that talent. I love her writing and the way that she just plays with plus her authorial voice, I guess. She does these really neat things with narration that makes this book just a joy to read. This story almost feels like a fairy tale. Like if you guys have not checked out the Mad Adam trilogy, I highly, highly recommend it. I don't know a whole lot about Margaret Atwood's writings. Like this is the first series of hers that I've read. And I'm just, I'm in love with it. I love the way she she has fun with with language and just I don't there's so much there's so much in her books and it's hard to kind of talk about the third book without talking about the previous two in the trilogy but I'll definitely be checking out more on Margaret Atwood. Alrighty guys and that's my wrap up. Um, I'm pretty proud of myself this month like I got through a lot of books and I overall had a really good time. The closest thing to a bad book was I guess The Stepford Wives, maybe Don Shard, and I enjoyed both of those. There were some just really good highs this month. Um, the Dragon Republic, honestly, if the longer I sit and think about that, that might end up like just in my top level of books that I've loved, especially this year. But with all of these out of the way, it's definitely time now to focus on that huge TBR I have for the readathon. Team Kevin McAllister, we can do this. And uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Please leave some comments down below. Have you read any of these books? Would you like to read any of these books? Are you interested in reading the Bad Adam trilogy? Because I highly, highly recommend it. Um, anyway, guys, I will catch you later on this week. I think keeping a vlog has sort of fallen flat for me. So I think what I might try to do, especially with this readathon going on, is almost do like weekly wrap ups. That way I can still talk about these books when they're fresh in my head because I, I plan on getting through all 12 books. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> well, anyway, guys, I'll catch you all later.